Julio here, 
and I, I, I invite you to join me too. Welcome. Well, I, I, I thank for the doing that. And you see, that's a lot for his students where he's just picking the I don't have any clothes to get anything else with all the time. I don't put glasses on that. But uh, uh, you know what? He didn't tell you. He said, well, they went to his office and he started talking to me about math. Uh, differential equations. I said, what? He said, differential equations. I said, oh my God. I said, I have to go to the University of Havana to do two years of math actually to understand what he was talking about. So uh, I completely appreciate that. And uh, the other, uh, a good friend of mine actually was there. So that's one thing I have to say. And uh, thank you so much for that. That was actually uh, phenomenal of my career. And the second thing that I want to say is that it's good for me to be this place. So like 20 years ago, uh, uh, my parents lived just close by. I mean, this place was relatively small. Oh, yeah, FIU like was going, but now it is so growing. And I think that um, we're just a bunch of people um, uh, from many backgrounds and many things, and we're just grouped by a common interest. The quest for knowledge, for understanding biology, and understanding our world better. And I think that this is very important to me. And that's the kind of environment that, that we, where scientists actually do thrive. Okay, um, I tried to put together a talk that is interesting from my engineering perspective and from an, uh, an neurophysiology perspective. Uh, maybe I'm going to go into different topics, um, and I try to I try to do my best to, to convey uh, 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 the things that I want to convey. So um, let's start with the concept of reverse engineering. So reverse engineering, sometimes called back engineering, is a process in which systems are deconstructed. Uh, to extract design information from them. Often, reverse engineering involves deconstructing individual components of larger systems. I mean, many of the people here are engineers, so what you do, this is the forward engineering, you specify the, the features of the system, then you design and implement, and then you have a new system of products. So that's basically what engineers do. I love to work with engineers because you guys are problem solvers. So, um, and that's, we have a lot of those problems when you're a neuroscientist, right? So, and uh, reverse engineering is you have an existing system. Actually, you understand uh, the transformation, how the system works. Sometimes you have to decompose the systems into different parts, and then you re-engineer the systems. Either you copy the product, or you have enough knowledge that you can modify the product uh, and, and actually do that. That's from the engineer's perspective. What many neuroscientists don't consider is that we have been reverse engineering brains for centuries. That's exactly what has happened. But, uh, although many of us don't consider because you don't have an engineering degree, like, but this is basically what has been happened. Now, many of us uh, ask, why reverse engineering the brain? Why not the doctor brain structure and function from first principles? I know the laws of physics, uh, system optimization, uh, let's do modeling. So I think that there is a little bit of bad news in this respect. The bad news is that the brain is biological design. So uh, biological design is the work of a thinker, the natural selection. So and, uh, that work with a handful of material and mutations that ha can happen during a productive cycle of lifetime. So you have limited materials to build your system, and you have limited mutations that you can have because how DNA, how things actually work, you know. Uh, so in this school of local minimum, I can just give you an example. The retina is completely backwards. So actually you absorb light in this side of the retina, and you have the light has to go all the way through to get it in this. I mean, no engineer is going to engineer a system like that. You probably put the photoreceptor just right away so that you can sense the light and you don't have to go through all these light scattered and things like that. And the reason is because the way that sensory organs develop. I mean, you get my concept. So the same thing with the giraffe neck and the same thing with many things that you have. So you really have to deconstruct the system to understand it and not assume that by modeling uh, lots of physics and optimization, you can understand. That's a good reason. So this is one of the first bioengineers that I would say, or, or, or neuroscientist, um, uh, which was Ramon Cajal. And Ramon Cajal, many, many years ago, actually, he discovered that the tissue, uh, the, uh, he got a Nobel Prize in 19, uh, 1906. Um, the, the tissue is called the brain, is composed of individual neurons. So and each nervous element is absolutely a cell. And uh, these are drawings of Cajal, so he was looking at the microscope and drawings. He wanted to be an artist, and he has some several paintings out there. 
So by, by the way, uh, there is a, a, a super interesting information that I love to that because sometimes I mention that to my Cuban friends. I say, oh yeah, of course, it has to be. So Cajal was in the, in the Spanish force in Cuba, was fighting for the Spanish, not for the Cuban. That was in 1875, and he got malaria. So they sent him back to Spain. And I said, oh no, because he was in Cuba, he got the Nobel Prize. I said, no, 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 that has nothing to do with one with the other. But what I know was that when Cajal was actually there, he was taking water from the swamps in the province of Camagüey. And the officer actually complained that he was just spending too much time taking those waters and looking under the microscope. That he wasn't doing a good thing, but good that he did it because actually his real passion was science. He wanted to work for engineering. So now there is a, a, a little bit of a bad news uh, that we need to take that not all brains are alike. So here is the brains of different species by this uh, review from Herculano Hoso. So Susanna is showing here uh, uh, different brains from different species. And what she does is take the weight of the brain in grams and then got to count the number of neurons in each brain. And I just gonna want to bring something to your attention. The capybara, who is a South American rodent, has a 76 gram brain. And the macaque monkey, who is a primate, has 87 grams brain. And look at the overwhelming difference between the number of neurons between these two species. One has like uh, 1,600 million, and the other one has 6,300 million. So not all brains are alike. There is something that by you studying one brain, you won't understand all brains. That's exactly what I'm trying to say. Um, if you look at the neurons divided by weight, the ratio here for the capybara is 21, and for the macaque monkey is 73. The only thing that makes sense here is to compare brains that are about the same size, because they're both metric laws that has to do with number of neurons and the way that the volume is actually towards the brain. So if you ask the human, the number is 57, which is lower than the macaque monkey, but you can't do that because the human brain is much larger in volume. So uh, what I want to say is that all brains have particularities. So I'm going to talk about memories today. And these are memories from my lab. So and I can tell you, it was at a sushi restaurant in London, Ontario. Actually, this was in Chicago at a Cuban restaurant. That was during a surgery, that was in an event that we have, that uh, two of my trainees and a neurosurgeon, John, actually uh, working on a, on, on a surgical project that we have, McGill University, uh, Secret Santa. So I have all of these in my brain. How is that the brain makes those memories? And, and, my, and my point is, and I don't want to, uh, I, I have to make sure that I don't get sued by uh, Toys R Us, but my, my motto here is like memories are us. That's what we are. So uh, actually, how do we form those memories? and that's what I want to talk today about. So there are three a category of memories according to how long the memory lasts. Uh, it could be divided into sensory memory that many of us envision and call iconic memory. It's about in 200 milliseconds. So the stimulus is here and uh, then goes away and you can keep it for 250 milliseconds or else. Uh, the short-term memory where it goes until several seconds. So I tell by the phone number, now you, you can dial the phone number uh, because you remember that uh, and the long-term memory, which is last for memory days, years, the whole lifetime. So these are the three memory uh, type of memory. I'm going to talk about short-term memory and long-term memory in this talk. So short-term memory is the ability to remember information for periods of seconds. It is the gate to long-term memory. You show you you load things in short-term memory, and then you actually uh, uh, could store them in long-term memory. And there is this famous model from psychology, the Atkinson and Schiffrin model. Uh, in which uh, there is the sensory store, which would be like sensory memory, then uh, information could go to short-term uh, store, the uh, short-term memory, and then information can go to long-term memory, or it could be lost, because if you're gonna remember everything, you could know all the phone numbers of your friends and all the things happen, so that doesn't happen. So you only get into long-term memory things that are important. Psychologists, I was at UCSD, so I said, you guys, you love boxes. And they look at me like, are you gonna talk bad about boxes? And I'm not talking bad about boxes. These boxes have helped us to reverse engineer the brain. Because now we can kind of isolate the problem, and now we can actually look at the individual components. Of course, the brain is a way of boxes. Everyone knows that, but that uh, is a good thing. Um, so we're gonna talk about short-term memory. Uh, I'm gonna to refer to it as working memory. Working memory is a type of uh, short-term memory which you uh, that uh, you have not only storage of information and maintaining the information, but you could manipulate the information. That uh, you can think about, okay, I figure I can do rotate an image, or you imagine yourself in a pool in Miami Beach, or you could imagine yourself in a pool in Mexico, and probably um, that's some sort of manipulation of information. Now, this is very important. 
deletion studies for a dissociation between short-term and long-term memory systems. So somehow, apparently, if you do a deletion study, for example, in 1936, Jacobsen deletioned the precrossal lobe of three species of primates, and what he finds is that it was a short-term memory deficit, but the long-term memories were spared. So basically, the memory that happens years ago, if they have acquired knowledge of something like uh, um, months ago, that was spared. That's just a precursor cortex, the most anterior part of the brain. By the way, this part of the brain appears uh, de novo in, in, uh, in primates. In, uh, uh, start with start with um, prosimians, and then it start growing in, 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 in other than human primates. That humans they have 30 30 percent of the brain of humans. Is part of the brain. So um, there was another uh, very important discovery in 1957. When uh, HM, everyone knows HM, when you remove the hippocampus bilateral, which is right here, it's just the inner temporal lobe all the way down, uh, these patients didn't have a problem with short-term memory, but they had a problem with long-term memory. So Brenda Milner, that was the one who did that study, um, who did the study, uh, she described that you would just come to the room, introduce yourself to HM, and then it goes away, and then after that, like, I don't know, five, 10 minutes come by and say, hey, how are you doing? Oh yeah, who are you? I mean, well, I introduce again, because the guy just he couldn't form new memories, like the movie Memento or something like that. That was the, the whole idea. Um, so, and, uh, a, a, a friend or a colleague of mine, uh, Joaquin Fuster, he's a Catalan that is now in, in, in LA, super uh, interesting person. He did a, a, a study where he, uh, he found a neural correlate of the mechanism of short term memory. So, in long term memory, all of them probably do neural networks. We know that these things that you call wave matrices, that is exactly where long-term memories are, we believe that they are stored in the strength of those wave matrices in the neural network. So short-term memory is a little bit different. You don't want to store in these waves because once you store them in those waves and you modify the waves, then it is a long-term memory. So what Fuster did, he trained a monkey uh, to do a, a, something that we call in the Wisconsin general test apparatus, which is very similar to the Wisconsin test that we uh, apply to patients. And then it was in, uh, in this uh, setup, and then you have two wells, and then you show the footies in one of them, and then you occlude both of them, and then you lower the screen so the neuron doesn't see. He saw where you put it, but now when you lower the screen, he has to remember where it is, short term, right? Then after a few seconds, you go up with this, the response period, and then it goes right away to here. If the animal has a lesion in the prefrontal cortex, forget, it goes 50%, 50%, so it's really uh, uh, doesn't know what to do. Um, and then he recorded from the lateral prefrontal cortex, which is area 46, if you know your anatomy. If not, it's just located in the anterior uh, side part of the brain. And then what he found was that there were neurons representing where it was. Some neurons were reacting when it was on the right, were spiking along when it was on the right, and some when it was on the left. And they were silent when it was on the left, the ones that were on the right. So you have neurons selected for right location, remember location, and left remember location. And this sustained activity in the absence of sensory input, when the screen is down, right, um, uh, uh, is what he called persistent fire. And that is where we thought that uh, the memories are stored. They're storing this persistent firing, and when persistent firing extinguishes, the memory is gone. By the way, Joaquin experiment wasn't exactly with the Wisconsin test of Rado, it was a modified version, but you get the point. So I'm using this for didactic purposes, because I don't want to go into it. So that was in 1971. And from there came the work of Patricia gomar rahid uh, one of my idols, in, uh, she was at Yale University, uh, and I think that she was an extraordinary visionary in, in, in many places, and she confirmed all of this, and she went further with models, and, and a lot of things that I, I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Now, when the fMRI came, actually, like a couple of decades ago, um, people start finding that if you have a working memory test, for example, to remember one of these patterns, that was Frank Chong at Vatican, so he actually, found that uh, there was ball activity uh, encoding the contents of working memory in the back part of the brain, in sensory area. But monkey neurophysiology didn't really find that. Monkey neurophysiology was a big contradiction, but is the whole brain encoding those working memory, those uh, sustained activity patterns, or is just a prefrontal cortex, or where are they? So that's where we started our, uh, our uh, the part of this uh, working memory research, and we said, well, you know what? We're going to put electrodes in different parts of the brain 
because uh, our reported spike in activity was what Brewster described. Uh, from this spike in activity, we're trying to decode the contents of our team member. We're going to see if what happens. And then what we did, the experiment was um, um, we chose a, a model that was a macaque monkey. Uh, one of the things that we know is that the macaque monkey actually, um, uh, uh, we know quite a bit about this, the biology of these animals. We know that information goes into the different pathways. For example, ant is keeping the retina and the LGN, so when information goes into the cortex into B1, information gets split into the different pathways. So the pathway, the dorsal pathway, has information about position, speed of object, uh, uh, visual disparity, and the ventral pathway, pathway has position about what is called the where and what pathway. So uh, faces, colors, orientations, and as that information is decomposed, and information then converts somewhere in the prefrontal cortex. Just to talk a little bit about the biology of the, of the thing. Now the question is, where are the visual pathways is working memory and coding? Is everywhere? It's just a distributed system? Or is a system that it depends uh, on that? That's a very clear question. Uh, what we did, we designed first a task for that. I'm just going to, uh, if you can play this object here, if you click save the point there, and I'll be showing you this arrow, right? And now I say, well, remember which one was the arrow. And now I'm going to show you uh, uh, different arrows there. And then you have to press a button when you find the same one that matches the one that I showed before. The one that I showed before was the sample. And then there are the tests. And when the test that matches the sample comes, you say, button. so then I know that you remember for this short time period, you remember what was in a, a less a short-term memory tab. This is kind of a layout of the short-term memory tab. In this case, this was a random dot pattern. It's kind of relevant. Uh, the red arrow uh, shows you the object. And then here we have the delay period. That is where you have to remember what that was. And during then you have the test periods in which you just press the button when the thing comes out that was similar or it was exactly the same. So monkeys can do this task pretty well. And uh, what we did is that we, many of you know single neuron recording, extrasolar recording. Uh, you go with an electrode very close to the neuron, and then you, you, you drive the electrode there, and then you record the responses of neurons uh, that. So there is a lot of electronics going into that, but uh, that's what you guys are good at. So and then you can look at the number of action potentials per time unit, and you will detect whether there is persistent firing or not whether the contents of working memory are represented in this firing pattern. So, um, and then when we did that, and we record in one area here in the back part of the brain, that is called area MT. Area MT usually processes motion. So they have cells that receive inputs from area V1, so and then they process motion. The cells are reacted to motion features, and our patterns were motion up, motion to the right, to the left, motion down, so that's how we and when you do that during the sample presentation, you see that this specific cell responds more to motion to the right, then uh, uh, to motion uh, down, and then to right and left. So it's a tuning curve that usually is described by a Gaussian uh, uh, function. But what you see is that there is definitely um, uh, tuning here. So if you are listening to this cell when you're showing the pattern, you can tell what kind of pattern you're showing. But it's a little bit tricky, not to one cell. But, but if you look at a group of cells that they have this selectivity, you can say exactly what I'm showing on the screen. I used to play that game. I used to hide behind the recording, and I said, I'm going to tell which, uh, what I'm presenting there. And then I step out, tell him, tell him, step out, I'm okay, my supervisor. Um, and I say, okay, now it's off. Yeah, when I hear the cells firing, I say, now it's off. He goes, yeah, it's off. Well, now it's left. Oh, no. And I used to play that game because you can identify the responses. So, the sensory the sample period, no problem. When you go into the memory period, the cell was silent. You say, well, cells in MT, they're definitely not encoding this working memory representation. So that was the, the, the first conclusion. But if you go into area MST and lateral prefrontal cortex, that area located more anterior in the brain, that integrate information from many systems, uh, if you see here in the memory period, you see exactly that the cells are actually encoding the direction of the sample. So we can extract information about what the animal has in mind uh, um, uh, during that time. This is a closer that you can get to mind reading. I, mean, you would have, uh, uh, I wish that we could do that with many things, especially uh, BMIs and things like that. That's exactly what you do. But um, what we found is that that information is not in early sensory area. So what the fMRI signal is picking up, in my hypothesis, is probably some uh, feedback signal that is actually uh, getting a lot of the potentials uh, 
that's my thing. So this is just a summary of this. Now, what are the mechanisms of persistent firing in single neurons? I mean, if you're going to reverse into your neurons, your brain, you have to keep going. I mean, that wasn't possible. Yeah, I would publish, publish some nice papers, but that wasn't the goal. There was actually to, to, to understand this. And we have a couple of, of ideas. Why a cell will just keep firing? I mean, why would the cell keep firing even if the sensory input is not there? There is no input into the system, and now you have the cell firing. So we thought, well, maybe it's just a capacitor. The cell stores energy. So you got the input coming in, then you store the energy, and then you discharge as the capacitor, and the length of your memory is going to be the length of the discharge. So it's the tau of your capacitor, right? So that's what we thought, and we call it capacitor-like single cell. Uh, that could be pretty much what happens, even if you stop the input here, what you see is the input, and this is the cell firing, that uh, it goes, and that would be this slope, which is basically the tau, the activation of the cell. But could also be, could also be, that you have recurrent network dynamics because the cells are connected. Is I call passing the ball. The cell pass the ball to the other and pass the ball to the other and pass the ball to the other. And then we do a recurrent network, network dynamic, and that's how persistent firing just remains. Okay? So it's, it's very simple. What we did, we, we use a technique called optogenetics. And many of you may be uh, familiar with optogenetics. What you do is you use viral vectors, and then you load viral vectors with promoters and genetic material to express ion channels. And these ion channels are just basically channels that if you apply light to it with the right wavelength, they could open in the membrane, and they could do exactly the same thing that when sodium channels open. So you depolarize the membrane, and when you depolarize the membrane and you hit the threshold for sodium activation, sodium and potassium channels, you get an action potential, basically. By expressing these uh, proteins in the, in, the, in the wall of the cell, you can use light, and then you get action potential. Uh, uh, well, there is a couple of elements. It's, it's not that uh, uh, simple. You have a promoter. Promoter is a piece of DNA that has a specific piece of cell types. For example, I can use promoters to express myoxin only in excitatory nerves, or only in inhibitory nerves, or only in dopaminergic nerves. So that's a promoter. Uh, the opsin uh, um, is basically, you could have different types. The channel could be excitatory or inhibitory. The channel could actually make the cell to depolarize and fire action potential. Why could hydrochloronics the cell, for example, by a chloride pumps or hydrogen pumps? And I actually can uh, uh, do that. Just keep in mind, this is just genetics, right? So depending on the sequence that you insert into the genome of the cell, the expression of this channel is going to be. And then the cell machinery just takes charge of the whole thing, and then express it goes and expresses into the membrane. And now you have the cell full of little things on the membrane that you can actually, uh, excuse me if I'm saying something that is trivial, but I don't know the audience very well, and there are a lot of students. So I, uh, anyway, I, I hope that it's not getting boring. So the fluorescent market is something that we use that when, when after that we can corroborate if it was expression of the opsin in the cell. It's just a tool that we use actually to, to assess that. Anyway, this is the structure of the virus that we use. Uh, it was uh, an AAV. Um, most of the viruses that we use are AAV. We used to use uh, Lenti. And, uh, and, and then we have a promoter that is called type 1 that all cell types express pretty much in the, in the, in the brain. And, uh, and then we have uh, an opsin that is called channel corrupting, uh, human channel corrupting in this case. And uh, this, uh, this is one of the things that we load in the virus and put it in the brain, it's just uh, uh, for technicality. So suppose that this is a cell. And what happens is that when you transfect those cells, with the, uh, when you infect it with the virus, and the virus uh, and the, uh, get incorporated into the machinery, whether RNA or DNA, in the genome, uh, you have translation of the protein, and because mammals express transretinol, you need transretinol for them, but mammals endogenously express that, insects they don't, you're doing that in Drosophila, you probably have to apply that thing, but, um, uh, and then you have the protein expressed in the membrane, and this protein is ready to go, okay? Uh, why it is ready to go? They say that we express channel rhodopsin, and channel rhodopsin, when you actually apply blue light, it means that this is gonna get open, and when it gets open, less uh, positive charge to go inside the cell, uh, for example, and then you can depolarize the cell. There is another one called halorhodopsin that uh, you can do exactly the opposite. You have negative charges when the opsin open uh, going into the cell, and you can hyperchlorize the cell, so you make firing more difficult. But you can kill firing because basically you get the cell down um, and the channel when the channel is open. By the way, these are different wavelengths because the opsins are sensitive to wavelength. This is, for example, uh, blue light for channel rhodopsin, uh, and yellow light for halo rhodopsin. So it depends what you what what your goals are. You, know, you want to silence, and you want what you want to excite. One of the things that, that someone told me is like, 
you know, everyone could hurt the brain and could damage the brain and could actually get uh, uh, deficit, but not everyone can actually enhance function, which is one of the most difficult things. And I think the opsin allows you to do both of them. So that's a very good thing to have in your repertoire. So what we did, we use, uh, uh, in a macaque, we use an uh, uh, opsin that is called uh, natural monoparonis uh, alurodopsin, which is an inhibitory opsin for this experiment. We developed a device with optic fiber, electrodes, all that kind of thing that you need for that to go over there and tell it to you. And then we inject it in this area of the brain that is exactly where Joaquin Kuster found uh, the persistent fiber, represented work. Um, to make the long story short, our idea was that um, the sustained activity, this is a capacitor-like cell, and now we shut the cell down when the capacitor is discharging. What I do is accelerate the slope of the capacitor and the cell goes away. Uh, if it is actually a persistent firing, if I silence part of the circuit, the circuit is going to keep going. This is basically um, a little bit cartoon of the experiment. These are the opsins, the opsins expressed in the cell, the RHP, and now uh, we can uh, do that, open uh, the channel, and we can, um, so in this case, what you have is positive charges going out of the cell instead of going in, so you hypervorize the cell. And then the idea was that we are going to kill this uh, uh, capacitor cell. Right, because we just uh, uh, make the slope fast. So um, on the other hand, if it is actually a recurrent network, and we silence part of the network, right, because these are cells that are going into a recurrent loop, and if we silence some of them, what is gonna happen is that it doesn't matter, I still have others going, right? So activity is gonna be restored. That's the whole idea behind that. And we have an experiment, and we have a working memory task, it's kind of irrelevant, it's, it's very, uh, bread and butter of the motor delayed response task where you show something, the animal is fixating, you show uh, a stimulus, then you have the delayed period, the animal has to remember what the stimulus was. And when the fixation point goes up, it makes it a saccade toward the location where the stimulus was. So that he has to remember in his place where the stimulus was. When we do that and we record the activity to the prepare, so what you see in red is the activity. Let's just start with the control here on the right. Uh, this is working memory or delayed persistent activity when the animal is remembering, let's say, that location on the screen that we call it prefer. And, and this is when the animal is remembering other locations for control, just to make sure that this is what is happening. And what you uh, shine uh, um, um, green light, what happens is that we silence the neural activity. The little dots that you hear, they're called raster plots. And each one of these things uh, represent, each one of the rows represents a trial. And each one of the of the uh, of the lines represent an action potential. So when actually we shine that, the action potentials here go up. So we are successful. We kill actually the neural activity. But we didn't expect that they think the whole thing is going to go up again. So basically, what happened is that it just went up again as soon as the, the light goes up for that specific cell. So we're shining light in one cell. We're killing the activity in that cell, and then the the, the activity went on again. This is a control to make sure that we're doing the right thing. But the, the storyline here is like this cell is connected to a recurrent network. And it doesn't matter if you stop me and if I kill the, the slope of the, uh, and I do my power, the cell is just gonna go keep going because it's a recurrent network. So basically what you have is a recurrent network uh, that we know that the frontal cortex has a lot of connectivity. And um, I think the capacitor's own hypothesis, as appealing as it is and as simple as it is, and probably a good engineer solution to this problem, uh, doesn't seem to be working very well in our case. Okay, so it's basically a recurrent network dynamics, which makes things more difficult to study. Yeah, but uh, you know, what is a recurrent network dynamics? So I'm going to make a, a, a short summary here. And uh, the working memory encoding occurs in association areas. We found that. And the tools that we use is single cell recordings during behavior. So on behavior. So I'm, I'm going to highlight the tools in red because many engineers are interested in tools. So am I. And uh, working memory in, uh, in codes, uh, encoding in both recurrent networks. So it's basically, we use the opportunity for that. But what are the features found in association areas that enable <coughs> these recurrent networks to exist? Why do you have recurrent networks in association areas? And those things don't exist in sensory areas. Isn't that the brain kind of similar around? Well, uh, these are another piece of uh, news that is, uh, if you look at, for example, um, in the cortex of the mouse, uh, this is area V1. V1 in the back of the brain and frontal uh, areas in this part. This is how the cortex looks like. If you do a section and you look at the number of cells. So the cortex, the, the frontal is a little bit bigger than V1, but if you do that in a monkey, you get V1 is actually kind of a small and the prefrontal cortex has grown a lot in thickness. So 
there is something there that is happening that it makes mines and, and uh, or rats, it was not rats, that was from Jennifer Hook in Boston, uh, make it different. But if you're gonna look at the neurons under the microscope, the neuron in B1 in the mouse looks like this, and in front of course it looks like this, it looks like kind of the same. A little bit the same, so the same side. But if you look at it in a primary, the neurons in the prefrontal cortex, they have grown quite a bit. They have like much more area, much more volume, much more dendritic, much more axons than they're spread upon. And with much more axons and much more dendritic, they also have more dendritic spine. So they have more possibility of record. That's one thing that we know that happens. So these prefrontal neurons are so branched out and have so many dendritic spines where all the cells make contact. That's one thing. But then we ask the question, well, what about interneurons? How, how can we go into that circle a little bit more in detail? Because the brain is not only excited for a network, network, uh, network. Don't be a dream of an engineer because you do a feed forward network and bam, and then you get the thing out there, right? Well, not that simple. You have a bunch of 20 or 25% of your cells are interneurons. They're inhibitory neurons. They're in the cortex, and we need to take them into account because they're not there for no reason, right? So um, and we have this model for Xiao Jing. Uh, 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 um, he's a compositional model. Um, Chao, Chao Jing is at NYU, and I have learned quite a bit from him. So basically, Chao Jing has this model uh, in which each one of these gray things is a pyramidal cell. And what you have here is 0 degree, 180 degrees, and 360 degrees is the tuning where the memory, uh, the spatial memory, is encoded. So it's just uh, taken at that. And these neurons connect to each other through the current network if they're the same tuning, if they encode the same location in space, say 180 degrees. So there are three types of interneurons, the parvalbumin, calretin, and calvinin, and these different type of interneurons, which are neurons that use GABA as a neurotransmitter, so they inhibit other neurons. But that's, that's, uh, and these interneurons connect in a very particular way. There is a specificity of connectivity. For example, the PB neuron receives input from the pyramidal cell and projects to other neurons directly. And if the, the cell body is actually of the pyramidal cells and to the other neurons. There is a calretin in positive interneuron that is a very interesting neuron because the calretinin positive, what it does really inhibit other interneurons, like the calvinian interneuron that is inhibiting the pyramidal cells. So you have two interneurons inhibiting pyramidal cells, the PV and the calvinian, but you have the calretinin cell that inhibit the, the one of these interneurons. So it's inhibition of inhibition. So like that. And it's almost like you have one more switch that you can, you know, uh, um, uh, manipulate to Get the system. So, and these are the synaptic connections because it's GABA, of all the three color interneurons, they do GABA. But, um, and this uh, facilitates pyramidal cell activation. If I'm inhibiting an interneuron, I'm facilitating the recurrency between pyramidal cells. So, actually, I get the hypothesis right. Because I'm inhibiting the guy who is inhibiting the pyramidal cell. So, and our hypothesis was it was simple. Um, that uh, if we have an increase of calretin in neural activity, you're going to have more recurrency. That's good, right? So, uh, and let's say that you increase the number of calretin in interneurons, in this case, where you're going to have more inhibition of the calvinian cells, and then you're going to have uh, favor input integration or recurrent activity. I think that was it's clear. So, in this case, we did a, a immunophysiochemistry analysis, so we actually uh, when the animal gets at the end of the lifetime, or someone uh, is euthanizing an animal somewhere, so we can actually say, okay, don't do it, for whatever reason, veterinary reasons sometimes. Um, we can do histology on that, the same way that you do histologies in, in, in humans, right? And then we can quantify the number of interneuron types by using antibodies to target these different neurons. So it's a very standard technique. Um, and these are antibodies that we use in NPM, SPN, and PFC, same areas where we're recording from, and we're gonna quantify which interneuron type is predominant. And what we found basically, uh, I'm plotting here only for valbumin and calvetinin. The calvetinin is, is, uh, is not here. Uh, but this were our hypothesis was that calvetinin are gonna be more abundant in the prefrontal areas, in, in areas where you have recurrent frequency. And uh, indeed, if you look at here, for example, LPFC in layer three, you see a lot of red. And if you look at here in, in, the, in, in, in MT, you see less red. So for some reason, then you have more calretin in interneurons in that, and if you compute the, the ratio PB to calretin, uh, what you see is an increase decrease of the ratio in LPFC. So basically what <coughs> happens is that you have another reason to favor recurrence. So it's looking like the brain doesn't look the same from the back to the front. It doesn't look the same in sensory and association areas. We bring other sort of properties. And here is the summary of this. 
So uh, what we have with larger neurons with more synaptic spines will have resonance predominate in the frontal part of the brain, not exactly only in prefrontal, it's in other association areas too. And that recurrent network allows you to have a track to a mental space. If you close your eyes, you could imagine yourself, I don't know, going on a cruise, on a bike, or doing whatever it is, but you don't have sensory input to daydream, right? But in the back part of the brain, those guys keep you on check. So it's a reactive network that has a fewer recurrent uh, 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 activity. And in this case, uh, when the sensory input is on, the cells are active, the sensory input is off, the cells are not active. So it keeps you in check. That's reality. Well, imagination, leave it to the frontal lobe, right? So that's the, the whole idea. Um, well, we, we have a whole consortium so we're 14 universities doing uh, this work, and we have a, a database uh, with uh, features in, in primates. And you can go to this website and look at the database in which we are doing patch plan, histology. We're exploring these three different areas systematically uh, with my partner in crime, Amy Arsken at Yale. And she's actually, uh, uh, we are collecting this project from your next, more interested in pathic plasmas. Now, there is a problem that it was bothering me for a long time, right? That experiments that we do in the lab under certain conditions are production in some nature. I mean, when are you sitting down in front of the computer screen? Oh, that thing comes. Uh, okay, now I'm gonna remember. Oh, that thing comes again, maybe you'll do that. You may want to remember where your car is in the parking lot. You want to remember things like that. So it's a very unnaturalistic. Of course, we have to reduce. We have reductionists by nature because to understand a complex system, you have to reduce it. But when you trim the parts of the complex system because you reduce it, you may not have the same system again, right? So uh, that, that's, that's the biggest problem. So it bothered me that um, that, that was happening. Uh, and the question was, how do neurons and code work in memory really when you are in, uh, doing the prototype task? And there is a standing issues. First, how do you emulate the contingencies of natural behavior in the lab? It's hard. Uh, how do you increase the number of neurons? Because if you want to take recurrency, you have to increase the number of neurons that you recall from, that you measure from. It's a, uh, an Ethereum problem. How to increase the precision of brain exploration? Because now I want to know not only the prefrontal cortex, where I'm in area 46, in area 45, so I need to know. The first thing that we did was to do virtual reality. Uh, you know, there's a lot of video game engines. We took on real engine at that time. This is a picture of LA. I, did, I couldn't find a picture of Miami. Uh, uh, for this, uh, that was a little bit hard to find that he didn't have things that I didn't want to have in the picture. So, uh, LA was also hard, but I found this one. Uh, and then, um, and there is the Hello, uh, uh, for example, I like this game. So, I mean, it's kind of a first shooter game, but you're killing aliens. I mean, it's just like, but I also like when, when, when you're playing it. Anyway, there's a lot of things to help. But the whole idea is that the, the video games allow you agency. So, you can change the world around. You can make decisions, you can choose, it's not the path that I'm making you to do, and now you have to do what I want to do so that I can get my data and I can interpret the data. That's not the case. So um, uh, here it is, uh, one of the animals playing a uh, video game, which is basically, uh, you have to match this uh, to the color of the, of, of, the, of the environment, of the walls, and you go, uh, then just, uh, uh, it's called a match to sample task, basically you have the blue, and the animal can do, and they can do that pretty well, so apparently, uh, they do. Here is the second thing that we solved. We use the Huda array, which is a micro uh, electrode array that you can implant and it's probing in the brain. It's used in the brain gate trials, by the way. And this Huda array allows you to record from only electrodes at a time. And if you have several of them, you can record from more electrodes at a time. And the third thing that we did is to develop a brain navigation protocol. So uh, one of my hobbies is neurosurgery, brain navigation, and that kind of thing, so I love it. Um, and then we develop a protocol where we do a CT scan, an MRI sequence, and we align those sequences in that. And now we have a, 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 a coordinate system in which we can plan trajectories like neurosurgeons do. And then, so uh, and these trajectories, we can then implement it uh, via precision body surgery. So we have a robot that allows us to do that. There's a, a, an injection of virus that we have in a certain area. So you have a little robotic arm there. And then uh, we can replay that, the things that we do, and we can do segmentation of the structures, we can do a lot of things in there. So actually, uh, in this task that I'm gonna try to go quickly over it, because uh, I, I don't want to run over time. Um, basically, we designed an arena, where you have nine different locations, and you can ask an animal to remember one of the locations. For example, this is when I show a cube here, then we don't let the animal navigate toward the cube, toward the position. Uh, but the animal has to wait, the queue now goes away, 
and the animal has to wait. And when, I, when we let the animal go, uh, they have to navigate to the position. So you say, I have to remember where the cue is. We don't let the animals do the joints. They're, they're pretty smart at the beginning. They say, oh, well, I'm going to keep trying. But they say, oh, I'm not going to try. This guy is going to come go anywhere. So I think they do that. So you have three periods. You have the cue, the delay, and the response. And now you have uh, uh, the performance of the animals. So they did very well in all these tasks. But we found something super interesting here. We were expecting persistent firing. Uh, like that was a little bit of serendipity. What we saw is that we aligned the cells by firing rate. This is the delay period. These are many neurons that we recorded in an array. We record hundreds of neurons at the time. And this axis is uh, a neuron. So neurons are firing in spikes. And then suddenly we saw that when we organized the cells like that, we got a all sequence of the spike in activity. Yeah, that was like, oh, this, is, this doesn't look like persistent fire. It looks like a sequence. That is okay. like a sequence of replaying in the head. It's not good, right? So, and then when we look at individual cells and we applaud trial number, so it's different. This is not cell, it's trial number. Trial one, trial two, trial three. These cells were firing at the same time during the trial. They were locked to time, right, and during the trial. Uh, or space, so don't want to get into that. And all the cells were locked to that. So basically, you have sequences of activation in the cell. And what we have also found is that we had cells that were actually signaling the beginning, the end of the queue period, when the queue goes away, and the beginning of the delay period. That is actually when the delay period, and we call that time boundary cells, that they have been described in the temporal of human for uh, episode time. So these time boundary cells, uh, and the sequence, and the, and the activation sequence cells form something like, it's just a good mix for episodic memory. Right? What we thought here is that um, uh, we have identified the neural correlates of the episodic buffer of family, if you uh, uh, familiar with that, but basically uh, you have <coughs> events that are separated by activation of cells and events that are signaling in time uh, by, by this uh, activation. To the hippocampus person, that's why I asked the same thing that the hippocampus is not the same thing. In the hippocampus, you're playing long-term memories here, you're playing short-term memory. The things that go away, these activations go away, so it's a different thing. So what we did was like a system uh, technique. We actually construct vectors of time where the cell fires. We're not doing fire rate. These vectors are time in, in a cycle of cell firing. And then we put that in a multi-dimensional space. So those vectors are neuron one, time for neuron one, time for neuron two, time for neuron three of activation. Then you put those vectors in a multi-dimensional space. And then you reduce the dimensionality. And then you see that there is clusters according to the position that the animal was remembered. So you can do that on supervised clustering, and that's what you get. And um, when you actually plot the, the, the Euclidean distance between the clusters, you get this normal matrix of centroid. That's this funny uh, uh, three squares in the middle. Instead of being nine different locations, like in the diagonal, it has this three square in the middle. And what we realize is that, that these are actually the columns where the animal is going. So what the animal does is like, OK, I'm going to go to the center one now. I'm going to go to the left one. I'm going to go to the right. Because that's how the three-dimensional structure, that's how we perceive three dimensional structure. The funny thing about that is if we do it with the trajectory and we compute between trajectories in 3D space, so you have to, to get into the system and make sure that you have the right perspective, uh, you get exactly the same grouping of the trajectory distance between trajectories in this 3D space. Uh, then when you actually do a correlation between these two matrices, especially in correct trials, you have a spherical correlation coefficient that's high. Basically what that means is that the sequences match the behavior. So basically when you put them together. So we're explaining the behavior to that. Um, now we went farther and we said, well, we're going to do ketamine. Ketamine is a, a, a pharmacological agent that inhibits an MDA uh, receptors. And when we do that, uh, then we'll get completely messed up. By the way, those ketamine injections, they don't give you nystagmus. You don't fall into anesthesia. It's the same doses that people use in depression, in treatment depression. So patients are fine. So you give ketamine and it's something, they go a little bit higher. It doesn't go like a, 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 so. Um, we established this protocol with the ketamine. This is uh, one of the isomers of the ketamine, uh, which is commercially available. And when we did that, we saw that the performance, everyone couldn't find the place that they remember anymore. They were all over the place. They were just going around. And then after half an hour, an hour, they came back and they could do the task again. This is the performance. And we have a saline uh, also. There were injections of ketamine that they, they, if you give them a trick, they won't probably give you the leg so that you can inject them. Um, that was a very challenging project, but we did it. And uh, when we do the same multidimensional technique for clustering, what we saw is that pre-ketamine, there were very nice clusters there for the remember location. After ketamine, uh, they just went to all disorganized clusters, and then 
uh, here is essentially phosphate reorganizing in vitro solutions. So that was actually a pretty nice thing. Um, we're characterizing properties of neurons in the, I, I, I'm going to show you this uh, just shortly. Um, and what we are doing is uh, uh, patch clamping. So we, we cut slices against what animals get to the end of the lifetime. We cut those slices and then we do patch clamp. And we were looking for cells that they were responding only for a certain interval. Because those cells can make me the sequences. And I don't have to go into a recurrent network regime. Maybe they, they, the properties of the cell can do that. And this is one example of cell that we found. What you see here on top is a stimulus. So you patch the cell with an electrode. You impale the cell with an electrode. And now you can actually pass currents into the cell. And you can pass uh, square pulses of that intensity. And you can hyperpolarize the cell or depolarize the cell with different intensities for one second. And this cell was going happily. As long as you inject me a current, I'm just going to go. But if you go to this second cell, it was like, oh, you're injecting a current. I'm going to answer. I'm going to respond for 200 milliseconds, and after that, I'm done. So this cell, this is a cell that we call it bursting cell. It just responds transiently, and then it just completely stops. And this is a good cell to do sequencing because it means that if I can time those cells with the activation, I can rely on two things: connectivity and intrinsic properties to do sequencing. So I'm not going to go into that because I want to get to a couple of things that I want to show. Um, so the working memory for episodes seems to be that relies on sequences. We call them NAS, it's a kind of protection aid. And they seem to be uh, uh, dependent on NMDI receptors. Uh, so we use virtual reality, pharmacology, and digital modeling. So the NAS are keeping us busy now. I think that is the brain. In my life is in brain surgeon has been necessary. I'm going to switch to long-term memory. Operate. You know who this person is? Many men and women, many hundreds. Plenty of you. Uh, and to expose the brain under local anesthesia with the co patient conscious. In those operations, it is that was an ultra neurological institute. Procedure. Specialist narrated. Cortex uh, electrically. Uh, These are not experiments. How in that he process, stimulates the brain. Quite accidentally on the site. If there is recorded in the nerve cells of the human brain, the complete record of the stream of consciousness, all those things of which a man was aware in any moment of time, are a feeling when the. I'm just going to switch to the part where they're stimulating the brain. brain with its gentle electrical current. It is as though the electrode touched a wire recorder or a, or a strip of film and he relives a period of time. When I talked to them afterwards about how it seemed to them, they say it is much more real than any remembering. It is as though they were re-experiencing it. I believe you're about to hear the actual words of patients in response to this stimulus, which they were quite unaware of, while they were in the operating room. You will hear them as I heard them. I have a sudden feeling as though I lived through all this before. That's how I feel. You know what I think, my friend. And I so, uh, uh, I'm going to stop it here. It looks like a, like a movie. Like I, mean, I, I can show you the video later. But what Pencil is doing is stimulating the temporal lobe in those patients and evoking memories. It's what he called the, the experiential recall. It's fascinating. Uh, it's funny because the nurse at some point is kind of has a smirk in her face as the film was. And I love this video. It's black and white. It looks like one of these old movies anyway. So um, at that time at the Montreal Neurological Institute, um, uh, Brenda Milner, she's also one of my uh, uh, idols. I, I interacted with Brenda when I was in Mobile a lot, and she's an amazing person. So they had the case of Harry Mollison, that when they uh, uh, produced uh, uh, the resection of the temporal lobe, Harry Mollison has the ability to form long-term memory. That's my transition to long-term memory part. Okay. So they couldn't form long-term memory. And in 2014, John O'Keefe got the Nobel Prize for uh, actually um, uh, discover a navigation system that was called the cognitive map, which is a system of uh, place cells, border cells in the hippocampus, and then the most receptors, the grid cells in the in the uh, in the rhinal cortex. And the whole idea here was that what these areas are doing is forming a cognitive map of the environment. And because the rodent uh, space is such a vital thing for rodents, what they do is memorize different locations and what the cells do 
is basically that. But we didn't really kind of didn't match very well to what uh, Brenda was describing with episodic memories in the in because it looks like the whole thing in the run was about space. And the whole thing in the in the and we know that it's not only about space in the run. I mean there are people like Tim uh, here that he has been looking at other processing. But that was surprising to us. And then in the human it was all about episodic memory. So okay, what how do we test that? We said, well we're gonna record from the hypercampus in nothing on primates. We're going to have a virtual reality task, and in the virtual reality task, we are going to uh, design a paradigm that is just uh, not only space dependent, it's going to have another variable in the space, and we're going to try to dissociate the space from uh, memories for features. For example, I could remember things that are not necessarily in space, I could remember things in time, and uh, I'm going to show you how this paradigm works. Uh, and this is our navigation paradigm so that we can annotate the hypocampus. And we have two different tasks for the animal. We made a virtual maze, which is, uh, that's the maze. Um, and we had, uh, uh, in the same virtual maze, the task that was for aging, they just go around collecting things. And we have the task that is associated memory, where we associate uh, uh, the animal, depending on the color of the wall, the animal has to choose one of these targets. They're always the target perception. I'm gonna show you that as well in this one. Um, this is the for aging task. The animal goes, oh, there is that red thing there, children go, and we're just gonna get it. What you see is an action potential firing. So the hypocampus has a very low noise regime, a special transport stuff. And so what I see, and that's what we call. Um, and the associative memory task, which is the animal goes now, there are many more spikes in this task for reasons that we are looking into. And now the walls change to steel. So you see these walls changing to steel. And at the end now, there are gonna be two color objects. If the color of the wall is steel, he has to go to the green one. So it has to learn that. But, uh, but if the color of the world is wood, now you have different wood colors. It's a contextual task, right? Uh, he won't go to the green one. He has to go to the orange one. You got the point, right? So depending on the context, that's goes to one of them. So when we do that and we plot the same cell in the two different contexts, this cell actually has no spikes in the foraging task. And in the association task, the spikes were uh, concentrated in the urban. And what those cells, I, I won't make a long story short, what those cells at the arm of the maze are encoding is the elements of the task. That it happens to be at that space, but it's not a space really like what the cell is encoding, it's the element, the association of the context and the color that happens at that time. So these cells are cells that are more general things than associative memory. Well, we can find place cells, basically. I could say, well, you know, find place cells, maybe. The problem is that you'll have a similar inputs because the animals are sitting on a chair, right? Well, now we change our model. We use marmosets, which are common uh, New World primates. And um, marmosets, we can test them pretty moving. So this is the brain of the marmoset. It's a still uh, a primate, actually. It's tiny, it's kind of like encephalic, but it's still uh, a very good model for the hippocampus. And um, what we did with marmosets was to let them free. And we built this system that was a little bit of work uh, when we actually have um, a a, a head a cap with markers that we can track optically with a tracking device. So we can have electrodes and we have more or less uh, transmitters that get the signal from the electrodes and send it to our system. And, um, and we have uh, uh, a maze, which is actually some compartment that we have in which we got all the sensors around. So whether it is cameras or, or, uh, or antennas, where we can sense that kind of thing. And now we can have the animals running around in the maze. And to make the long story short, um, uh, what we have is a bunch of signals relating to tracking the animal position. Because it's a rigid body, you also can track where the animal is, is, is uh, the head is directed, because the markers are right on top of the head. And you can also detect translations in space. And you have all the neural signals. And to make the long story short, this is just an example of tracking. This is an animal here. Uh, this is a marmoset right here. You see the markers here. It goes back, and then you look in this direction. And to see how accurate can we track, this is actually the represented reconstruction. And you see that animal is the head is the pointing direction. Yeah. So we can have a really good idea of what is what. Okay. So when we did that, we found something super interesting. That is that when the animal moves, actually, uh, what I'm show, showing here is the, the head movement, the body movement, and the head plus body movement in green. Uh, when you have the animal moving, uh, actually, in, in locomoting, the head doesn't move very much. For example, if I'm a primate and I have phobia, I want to stabilize the retina when I move. I don't want to be doing like that. I'm going to be very busy, right? Busy. 
So what I do is I try to do that, then I stop and I look around, and I have observed the animals, that's what they do, right? And uh, they stop and they move the head. Very rarely, they move the head and the body. When they're moving the body, they move the head. But if you do that in a rat, in green, it's the head and body movement. The rats go like, like that. And I think that the, what I think is that they're using the whisker system to actually, to, to in a radar light, to sense the environment. And if you lock the whisker into the oscillations of local potentials in the brain, you see a theta, a very nice theta rhythm. We don't find the theta rhythm actually in the primates, and I was like, um, so if you were to plot the, the head angular speed and the body angular speed, you see these big tails in the marmoset. And what you also see is that 80% of the of the of the head movement, what is this uh, here, happens when the animal is at rest, when the animal is stationary. And only 20% of the animal is moving. If you do the rat, you have the opposite direction. Most of the rat head movements happen when the rat is moving. So these are different strategies to, to, to sense the environment. And the reason is probably because the rat doesn't have far sensing. Not at least, I mean, the animals are not too hard dwellers. Maybe the capybara has it. Um, it's not a species, uh, it's not rotten versus primary thing. It's just a, a matter of what is the ecological niche of the animal. Um, we did a little bit of calculations here with the, uh, um, basically the gist of that, just say it, is that when we plot amplitude of the movement, of the head movement versus the peak velocity, how fast the movements go. The rat movements could be as big as the, as the marmoset movement, but the peak velocity is small. Because the marmoset does four of these head movements, for example, in a second, they go bah, 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 bah. That's the way that they stand the part. They go this, 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 this. Um, and in this case, uh, this is a representation while the rat is more the rhythmic sensing with the whispering. And things like that. So that was the evaluation. Um, this is an example. This is a cell firing when the animal is at this position all over the base. When the animal look at this part of the base, you see a lot of spikes. If the animal is looking down and somewhere else, you see a lot of This cell may look like a play cell, but it is not really a play cell. Because in a play cell, the cell should be firing any time that the animal is at this place, right? So in this situation, most of this fight happen when the animal is heading, looking in this direction. So um, this is a cell in CA3. Um, so um, basically, if you plot the number of action potentials as a function of position, this is what you get. And it looks like a play cell, right? But if you were to plot the gaze of the animal, and paint the walls of the maze with the gaze and with the number of the spikes, literally paint them. This is what you get, a huge view field. So these cells are actually encoding the view of the animal. And that's how we do that. I look at this door and this door, and I was telling Morten the other day, if I ask you how many steps do you have from your desk to the, to the, to the door of the, of the, uh, of the door, I say, I don't know. You don't know. But if you're a rat, you need to know. Because you don't have the far sensing, and you need that. You need to hit your wall, and you need to go there. So you do need play cells. You know these three cells if you're in a form of form. But if you're a human and you're in the night, uh, so you may use the same system. Right? So actually, um, I had a little five minute thing for the, can I still take five minutes for that? This is the conclusion in the, uh, uh, for all oh, I forgot that one slide. So that's how marmosets build cognitive maps. It's by gazing here, that's my view, that's my view, that's my view, that's what we believe. But, this is an infrared, and this is a pyramidal cell. Uh, so in the hypothesis, we can do that. And when we divide into neurons and pyramidal cells, and we look at the LSPs, we wanted to know uh, what happens exactly with the LSPs. Um, it, do the animal have theta like in rodents? And what we found, and make the, the long story short, is that when the animal makes a head movement, here is time for head movement, you have a huge theta oscillation in the LSPs. So, and I think that what this theta oscillation is equivalent to the theta rhythm in the rodents. As the theta, but the red rhythm in the rodent, it is a red. Here, it is not the same. Because every time that you have the theta phase resetting, when you tell all the neurons in the hippocampus, okay, shut up. Just lower the noise. There is something coming in, so that this information is out. So um, the proof for that is that when you look at inhibitory neurons here in green, they have uh, the time of the saccade, a very strong activation. It's almost like if you turn neuron, put the hippocampus into so long, no switching, and the excitatory results they come up. Um, so the last proposal, of course, neural primates have developed different strategies for forming cognitive maps in the environment. And I think that the visual hypocampus in the, the, the hypocampus in the primate is a GPS, sure. 
but he's forget it. He's a gay position, it's, a, it's not a global position, it's a global position. Again, that's what we think that, that we are asking. I have this part of the talk that is just five minutes. I'm not sure if I'm, uh, people are tired or can go over it. Right? Um, it's, it's a completely different thing. So it's about stem cells. So I'm going to talk about it. Then. So one of the things that um, that a system neuroscience faces is that it's extremely challenging to domain the responses of neurons in, in a species uh, during behavioral tasks. Um, why? The brain is very inaccessible. So the brain actually has like a jelly, it's protected by the skull, the uh, uh, membrane. Uh, if you damage it, it's called paralysis or something, just a tiny thing what you're doing in our surgery every night. And the brain doesn't regenerate, so there is no effective ways to repair the brain so far. It's, you know, there is a lot of physio and things like that, but there is no effective way. Um, and the other problem is that uh, some diseases are unique to humans. So even if you do animal models, you can do, can do it, or Alzheimer's in rats, or, or in mice, right? So, um, now there have been several uh, uh, things over the last uh, years, and it is a revolution in biomedical research. Human genome sequences are there. You can sequence the whole genome. You can do cell reprogramming. You can actually use tools for reprogramming, let's say, like crispr uh, um, sorry, different techniques for cell reprogramming. You also can edit the genome with CRISPR-Cas, for example, and then you can put genes and delete genes. And there is also tissue engineering technologies that many people here may be interested where you can actually culture tissue, you can make heart balls, you can make brain tissue, you can make organs. So um, so it is possible to make neurons for that. And my idea is what about if we use the, the same, uh, it's not my idea actually, uh, uh, but uh, if we can use the same techniques that we use in system neurophysiology for stored those networks, we can make of those uh, stem cells the right network. And they have synapses too. They have to connect to each other. So we kind of study basic processes. Right? Um, advantage, it is a less complex system. Uh, it is amenable to manipulations and replicate the features of mature circuits, depending on, the, on how long you can repeat them. Uh, problem, well, you don't know how a stem cell uh, uh, mimic the exact adult nervous system structure and function. And there are small networks, not entire brain. So if your question is about entire brains, and you know, that's not a preparation to do. But I'll give you an example of how this could be very useful. So red syndrome is a postnatal neuromental disorder that affects females exclusively. So it has epilepsy, it has uh, different uh, symptoms, seizures. Uh, they suffer a regression in development. When they're one year old, they start going back to development. And it's kind of painful to see that in some of them. They kind of walk intellectual disability kick pain, and, and it's very hard for part of the people that. And it's cause we have kind of narrowed down the cause to uh, MECPT gene in the X chromosome. That's what it's usually girls that have it. When you have a boy that has it, it's usually female, right? Um, because the, the, the only X chromosome in, in, in male, I mean, has it. And in the girls, you could have a heterozygous, so you can have chromosomes or whatever. So um, what you could do is you can take the skin of those patients, right? And you can revert the cells to iPSCs to, to a stem cell. Um, that was Nobel Prize, Yamanaka, uh, 2006, 2007. Um, uh, and now you can revert that. And now you can use protocols in which you induce actually neurons from there. And if you put it on a dish, they start connecting to each other. So they start forming a network. And this is a dream for any person that is doing neural network because now you have, well, you have the actual physical thing. It's not just like symbolic representation. You have the physical thing. And now you could do patch plan with those cells, you can do it for intrinsic properties, but you can also put them on a plate with electrodes and then you can actually uh, 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 detect activity in the plate. So we did that with some lines of the red syndrome with my colleagues at, at CK in Toronto. So, uh, and what we found first, the normal neurons are bigger and they have more than drive than the ones that you know how they have CP2. So you completely abolish these genes. There are still heterozygous, but you abolish the MECP2. Um, uh, in that cell line from a patient. And when you explore intrinsic properties, you see that, for example, the base, what we call it the baseball card project, trying to get funding from the Toronto Blue Jays. I don't know if you guys are not with the Marlins, we're not with the Marlins. <laughs> but anyway, the, the baseball card project, um, when you explore those cells and you start injecting corin into them, the normal, the wild type, as you inject corin, you see that there is an increase in fire. So the cells behave almost like a linear film, almost, right? 
many of these cells. But if you look at the red syndrome cells, they don't, actually, sorry. Uh, the red syndrome cells, they produce, they go high, but then they run out of juice, and they go, they can respond to the insulin the same way. And if you look at, um, this is just to plot visually that, that if you increase the intensity of the current, you see an in, the largest intensity of firing all on this corner, this is time, this is intensity of the stimulation, but in the red syndrome, it doesn't happen. Happen here, some of the intermediate space, it looks like some kind of five plasma filter. Um, um, so that was the first fight. Then we put them in an MEA, a microelectrode array, so the cells are floating here as one of uh, one layers. And when we do that, actually, we can observe them over time. When the cell wires, you see that the ensemble activity start coming up and coming up and coming up, and they start firing. And this is just an example of a recording of the MEA. Those are action potential for the individual channels, and you look at the individual channels, and this is what happens. It's amazing to me. These cells, they have one thing in mind, which cells don't have much. Okay. What they do is that they fire these action potentials, and they go and fire the sensory response. They go and fire, and there is a response. And I think that what they are doing is a genetic program. It's wired. And I don't know if you saw that way. I think this is an intrinsic channel that is going like, I want a pacemaker at this stage of development. That's what I need. Because what I'm going to get activity from, there is no external input, there is no retina, there is no somatosense. So that's what the cells do. They're wired. Well, you can extract from each channel the action potential as raster, and then you can have a map of uh, cells that looks like that. But this is the thing. This is the wild type. It's a beating heart of the cell. The wild type goes short burst, silent. Short burst, silent. When you look at the red syndrome, it's almost like going like a burst, Stuff. And the verse, and we have more in this story, but I don't want to say, all I only want to say is that the phenotype is different. So these guys are trying to wire, but either they cannot make it because the synapses are not functional the same way, or there is another intrinsic program that was triggered there that, that we don't know. Um, basically, the conclusion here is that the MECPD mutant neurons have lower thresholds, and in network they have a lower number of spikes, but it's a uh, so there is a network phenotype that we can rescue. Now we can we have a phenotype to rescue. I just put pharmacology or some CRISPR cas that you may be able actually to, to help those patients we get there with gene therapies or whatever it is. So just that uh, this is the conclusion. We make a brain from genes to networks. So you have the DNA, the RNA, the proteins that you make, and you can make neurons by putting those channels in the membrane of the neurons, and that's why you have excitable people, and so that you have a network of neurons that are diverse because you have different phenotypes. Um, but there is something that I have been observing, and, and this is a quest for me, it's just a message to the community. Uh, I don't know how much attention can I get, uh, but basically from the interaction of these thousands of genes, there is an, intri an, 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 an intricate molecular pathway in the, each cell. It's what we call molecular neuroscience, molecular biology. But now, when those things converge in single neurons, you can have events like action potential, and you have like postsynaptic potential. Those are excitable features, right? and if you're in the heart, you can have exactly the same thing. Um, but now we have networks, and the networks increase in complexity. And now we have networks, and we have connections. And now we can study how these networks connect. The problem is that we're standing, we're finishing up with a, with a, with an hour plan where molecular neuroscientists are on top of the hourglass and system neuroscientists are at the bottom, we cannot see through these narrow things here. And I do believe that the, um, the IPSC-derived cells and our stem cells-derived cell uh, cultures can fill a little bit this hourglass. We have to make this in a cylinder. We cannot keep with this hourglass because we will never figure out the brain. So it's just almost feasible that we're gonna figure out the brain. So we really have to go um, a different level from behaviors to your cortical, uh, to your fMRI or your EEG, and then we have to go into the brain, we look at single action potentials, networks, and now we also have to go into the molecular machinery, and somehow we have to make that a cylinder. It can keep being uh, say, uh, an hour. Um, this is a, some quotes from Sidney Brenner, number five. Progress in science depends on new techniques, new discoveries, new ideas, probably in that order. And that's how engineers they really can change the landscape and better with all its methods. And, and for the students, one of the things about creativity is not to be afraid of saying the wrong thing. So never be afraid of saying the wrong thing. But you have to be When I was learning German uh, in Germany, that was my So 
or every set of commands in a system called Bing. But I was never afraid, and after six months, I think I could speak German, unfortunately. So never, same thing for Sachs, never be afraid of saying the wrong thing. So these are the guys who did the job, so I have a, I can go over them, I mean, they are very, and I have fantastic collaborators everywhere, uh, but uh, my lab, I'm fortunate to have them around, and again, I, I could say some questions now, it's really fun. I'm sorry, I <laughs> <laughs> the short answer is, I don't know what is happening, <laughs> but I could speculate. Uh, my speculation is that these people have an extraordinary ability to form synapses. Now, human, human, the human uh, uh, neuron seems to be, the synaptic uh, uh, transmission is much more efficient than it might be. So somehow, if you get an action potential here, the ability to evolve for synaptic potential is much more efficient. So in in the hippocampus, this efficiency may be even enhanced. So there are two things that I have observed. The hippocampus is a very low noise system. Uh, it's a low noise system. I have, um, I don't know if I have here, um, uh, maybe a, a slide that I wanted, I show it that some stuff here, I'm sorry, I don't have it. Um, the hippocampus is like a wet cement. The synaptic plasticity is so enhanced by whatever resides in happen or, or, or you know, um, uh, MP, uh, uh, cyclic dependent receptor amplification, that if you are to the hippocampus circuit and your sensory input and experience get there, you're gonna leave the mark. And this mark is called a memory trait. Now this memory trait has to be replaced of course. So the hippocampus is wet cement. If for some reason, this cement is very well, or uh, the, the gate to the hippocampus, for example, is open, that thing is going to get there and leave the memory trait no matter what. The rest of the cortex is a little bit the, the work of the sculpture. The sculpture. Um, and it, it's like making a sculpture. You take a sizzle and then you start, and that's where consolidation happens with memory. I think that part of this ability is probably in the amount of plasticity that some people have in the hippocampus to capture that thing and it goes like that. Humans are also very good at one trap learning. I'm testing, I didn't show that, but I'm testing patients now. Uh, when we do patients, the same task that you give it to the monkey, so you have to increase the complexity of the task because the patients are just like, it's like you're looking at a Ferrari versus a bike, you know? I mean, like, it's not really, uh, and 